What's up my producer friends, I'm David with anothermonsterproductions.com. So a couple weeks ago I was working on this remix for a remix competition on Metapop and I went ahead and did a really long tutorial where I walked through the entire project. We talked about mixing, we talked a little bit about sound design, we talked about processing and personally I think it was a really good tutorial. You should check it out if you haven't. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description of the video if you guys want to check that out. But the one thing we didn't get to in that tutorial was mastering. So that's what we're going to talk about in today's tutorial. I'm going to go over the mastering of this remix. As you can see, I did use pretty much exclusively native FL Studio stock plugins. The only thing I didn't use is this Ozone Dynamic EQ, which is not necessary for your masters. And if you do want to use a Dynamic EQ, which can be helpful, we'll get into that in the tutorial, uh, you can use a free alternative, which is TDR Nova. So I'll try and leave a link in the description for that as well. If you guys want to download that plugin, if you don't have it, it's a great Dynamic EQ. Before we get into the specifics of my mastering chain within this project, there's just kind of a few things I want to talk about relating to mastering in general. And when I think of mastering in the context of mastering an individual track as opposed to an entire album or whatever, uh, I think of it as sort of the final stage where you're taking your, your final mix, which you've gotten your track about 95% of the way there or so. And you're really just trying to get at that last 5%. We wanna make it commercial ready. We wanna get it loud enough to be released. And we wanna try and enhance the sonic quality just a little bit more if possible. Now, what I've actually been doing for a while is doing everything all in the same session. So I produce, mix, and master all in the same session. And the reason for this is just that it saves me a lot of time. One thing I've been super focused on recently is figuring out ways Ways to speed up my workflow and ultimately save a lot of time. And traditionally you'll export your final mix down as a WAV file and then load it up in a new project or send it off for, to a mastering engineer and then they'll master that stereo WAV file. However, what used to happen to me a lot and this was also a while ago when I was not as good as mixing or producing. What would inevitably happen is I would send it off to a mastering engineer or I would be trying to master it myself. And when I actually got to the mastering stage, I would run into some issues with my mix. And so I'd have to go back into my session file with my mix and then tweak the things that I needed to tweak and then rebounce it down. And this process would happen, you know, several times potentially where there would be little things I wanted to tweak to kind of fix it in the mix. So if you have the computer power to do it all in the same project, if this is an issue that you're running into, you may want to consider doing it the way that I'm doing it. There's also nothing wrong with doing it the traditional way where you bounce it down to a WAV file and then you master that WAV file in a different session. Now, when it comes to mastering, something that I personally like to do is to have a reference track picked out that's preferably in a very similar genre, kind of a similar style to the track that you're producing and mastering. And what I wanna do with this track is just use it as a target loudness for what I'm going for with my master. So the way that I do that is I use this plugin called Ulean Loudness Meter. This is a free plugin. Uh, there's also a paid version if you wanna pay for it. Again, I'll try and leave a link in the description if you don't have this plugin already but this plugin measures LUFS or loudness units full scale and you can think of this as sort of a similar measurement to DBFS or decibel units full scale but the big difference is that when it comes to decibels you can actually have different perceived loudnesses based on the harmonic content of whatever wave file or whatever sample you're using in that uh, context so for example if I have like a kick sample I can have two kicks that are simultaneously hitting the same DB level, but one may sound way louder than the other one. And like I said, this has to do with harmonic makeup of the kick. Uh, you could add like distortion or saturation onto your kicks. Sometimes compression or limiting can also help achieve a higher level of perceived loudness. But anyway, what I'll do is I'll have my reference track, which doesn't necessarily need to be in the same project. Uh, you could load it in a different project and you just kind of run Ulean loudness meter on it. And you take a look at the short term LUFS and also the integrated LUFS. And you kind of get a sense of just how loud their track is overall so generally what i'll do is i'll go to like the loudest point so the drop section of the track and i'll take a look at their short-term lufs and i'll kind of see like what is the loudest part like how far are they pushing it and i've seen tracks i mean some tracks are like you know around five lufs some go into the fours i've seen some in the threes and the twos like dubstep tracks go crazy you know they're just 
getting it as loud as humanly possible. But you may have heard this thing uh, when it comes to streaming services that you know your your target LUFS should be negative 14. And that's actually talking about the integrated LUFS. So it's a good idea to kind of keep in mind your integrated LUFS as well, because your integrated LUFS is ultimately gonna be a lot uh, quieter than your short-term LUFS. Well, generally speaking, I mean, depending on which part of the track, but like, for example, on the drop section, it's going to be the loudest part, but then your integrated LUFS is probably still going to remain a little bit quieter. So when it comes to actually mastering for streaming services, personally, I wouldn't worry too much about actually trying to master like for the streaming service. So trying to, sh to shoot for that negative 14 um, LUFS, because every streaming service is a little bit different anyway. And the, the goal is you just want to have a good sounding master. So really all they're going to do is turn down your master if it's too loud and then turn it up if it's too quiet. And they're just trying to get a normalization so that when people are listening to it, it's not like one song is like suddenly super loud and then the next song is super quiet. You know, they want people to have a consistent listening experience on those platforms. Now, there is a website called loudnesspenalty.com and what this website allows you to do is actually drag and drop your audio files. You can do a wave or an MP3 and you can choose which streaming service you wanna to listen to your master on and it'll basically you know, do its algorithm thing, and then it'll allow you to listen to your master as if it were playing on that streaming service. So this is actually a really cool service. If you guys are worried for some reason about how your master may sound on some of these streaming services, then you can go ahead and do that before actually releasing the track it can ultimately make you feel a little bit better about things. So the last thing I want to mention before we get into the actual project is this chart, which is just an example of what your mastering chain could ultimately look like. As I mentioned in the beginning of this tutorial, in my opinion, the mastering process should be as minimal as possible. You want to do the least amount to make your final master sound as good as possible. So you don't have to do all these processes if if it if your mix doesn't need it. But generally speaking, you'll have, you know, some sort of gain plugin followed by some sort of parametric EQ, then maybe some multiband compression, maybe stacked with another compressor. In this case, they have another analog EQ followed by a harmonic exciter and then a limiter and then you have your metering down below. So let's go ahead and take a look at my mastering chain here. And if you take a look, so this first parametric EQ is actually not uh, part of my master chain. This was just for the intro of this. And actually, before we even get into my mastering chain, let's go ahead and take a listen to this track for those of you who haven't heard it yet. So we'll go ahead and do that. When you're in the back of my love, all you got to do is slow down Ooh, you gotta hunt you know now All you got to do is slow Right, cool so that gives you a little idea uh, i'll just briefly play the intro here just so you can kind of hear the difference so you can hear the difference there basically i just use this parametric eq as a radio effect for kind of a stylistic thing in the intro there. We talked about that in the last tutorial. So this is my first plugin in the actual mastering chain. It's a gain plugin. And basically what I do with this gain plugin is uh, depending on how, how loud my mix is. So this particular mix is I think peaking at about negative six dBs. If I were to take my Maximus off, we can take a look at that. But I mix pretty quiet. So usually I'll have the gain plugin to kind of, you know, turn things up if they need to. You could also use it to potentially turn things down if you need to. But let's take a listen. Do is slow down. Oh, 
So you can see there, uh, it, it, during the drop, it's that's the loudest point of the track, and it's peaking right around negative negative six dBs. So uh, again, you know, it, sometimes I'll turn this up more or less depending. Um, in this case, I ended up only turning it up 0.5 dBs, so not really doing a whole lot there. But next we have another plugin, which this one is actually I. I, I I think I ended up disabling this one as well and not using it. But as you can see, this one I was uh, experimenting with whether or not I wanted to do like a low cut on this track. Sometimes it's a good idea to cut out some of the low frequencies below 30 hertz or so. And in this particular mix, I believe I already had done this on both the bass and the kick. And so doing the extra on the master, I, you know, it just it wasn't quite sounding like it, it didn't feel like it really needed it and it wasn't sounding as you know as good as I wanted it to ultimately. So I ended up not using this EQ. I think I actually came back. I've, I've been working on this master over several weeks. And so I think I ended up doing another one um, where I did like the same thing here and then deciding I didn't like it again. Uh, so that both those EQs are not being used currently. That's this one here and this one here, I believe. Yeah, yeah, those two. Yeah, so those were both doing basically the same thing and ultimately I ended up not using them. So the next thing that I have is the, the Ozone Dynamic EQ. If you're not familiar with what a Dynamic EQ does, it kind of works in a similar way as a compressor where basically what it's doing is you can set a band like this one, for example, and then you set the level of the threshold. And if the audio signal goes above the threshold, it starts actually EQing out those, those frequencies. But if the audio doesn't go above the threshold, then it's not actually doing any EQ. So this is a good way to potentially, like for example, in this, in this particular example, um, I had a little bit too much of this sort of low mid area down here, which is causing a little bit of kind of muddiness in the mix. And I, especially in the drop section, I have a lot of synths and stuff that have a lot of uh, co uh, frequency content down here, which I kind of just wanted to smooth out and, and make that area sound very consistent and good. So that's where a dynamic EQ can come in and you can kind of fix that area because other parts of the track are probably not going to have as much buildup down there. So let's take a listen and we can kind of, I'll show you what it's doing. Now. So it's a little laggy because I've got so much stuff going on in this project. I'm also recording on my computer as well. So, uh, but hopefully you get a good idea of what's what's going on there. You can kind of see the difference between the build-up section and the drop. So dynamic EQs can be very helpful depending on your particular mix. Like I said previously, the idea is you want to get your mix as good as possible without having to use stuff like this potentially. But it is there if you need it. Next, we have a patcher preset, which is actually mid side EQ. Um, so this preset, if you go into your, your presets and patcher, it's this one here, the mid side EQ. So basically what's going on here is I have a mid, which I'm not really doing any EQing on. And then I have a side where I'm cleaning up uh, the low end quite a bit here. So I went pretty heavy. I mean, as you can see, this is a very steep filter that I have and when you're doing these types of really steep filters, you have to be careful because it can potentially mess with the phase of your mix. The default setting is these are both off. So linear phase is off and high quality is off. And what happened was at, when I was tweaking this, when I was listening to it, it basically like inverted the phase where I have these hi-hats that are uh, supposed to be coming out of the right speaker, which when I put these EQs on, they were actually coming out of the left speaker and just sounded a little wonky and weird. So just something to be aware of. If you are gonna use this preset with the mid-side EQ, which I definitely recommend you experiment with because it can help clean up the mix a lot. Uh, but if you're gonna do it, just you know potentially be aware of the phase issues that can occur. So you can turn on the linear phase mode, which is basically gonna retain the original phase before you had any EQ going on. Uh, smaller EQ boosts and cuts are not gonna really mess with the phase a whole lot. But like I said, these type of really sharp 
um, filters are are potentially going to mess the phase up quite a bit. So just something to be aware of. Now you don't have to necessarily do this this steep filter like I'm doing. Um, sometimes you can just do like a low shelf, and that'll get rid of some of the low frequencies. But in this case, I wanted to do like a really really steep cut. So here we'll take a listen. And one thing you can actually do is uh, disconnect this one. So we'll just connect the side, and then you can listen to just the side while we we edit this. So let's listen to the drop. So if you're listening on a good pair of studio monitor headphones or studio monitors, you should be able to hear pretty drastically the difference there between when I have you know the low end signal on the sides. Um, a lot of the synths that I have have different amounts of low end, and especially on the side signal because I'm doing you know depending on the synth, it has different levels of uh, stereo width associated with it. So. Um, this is a really good technique in terms of just cleaning up the low end in general. It does it throughout the whole track uh, here. We'll just, what we'll do is we'll go back in, reconnect the mid, and I'll kind of just show you the difference of what it sounds like before and after the patcher preset. So let's listen here. <laughs> So you should be able to hear the difference there pretty pretty easily if you're listening on a good pair of speakers. All right, so moving on, next you see we had this uh, exciter that I was experimenting with. And ultimately, uh, with the patcher preset and also what I did with the Maximus, I ended up deciding that the exciter was just too much. I actually like this master better without it, but it is something that you can potentially experiment with and see if you like. So next we have the Maximus, which is the final thing that I have going on here. And what I have going on in my Maximus is actually quite a bit. So first of all, I have pre-gain uh, basically going on in each one of these. So I'm boosting like 10.7 dBs on the low, 10.7. So I'm boosting like 10.7 on all these bands. And then I have some compression going on uh, as well. So I'm doing multiband compression here. I did have at one point just a, a regular compression or a regular compressor. I was using the Fruity Limiter and the compressor within the Fruity Limiter. And I decided to do the multiband compression instead within the Maximus. It can just sound a little bit cleaner, I think. And you can kind of get in and solo these bands and kind of listen to what's happening individually. Um, if we look at the monitor, settings you can see here i'll just play this a little bit So you can see the amount of compression that's going on in each one of these bands. And I do have different settings depending on it. So for example, on my low setting, I have the attack uh, pretty uh, short, I guess you could say. And that's to basically cut the lows uh, initially. This this track, so before I did everything, this track was too bass heavy in my opinion. And I ended up you know, cutting out some of the bass by, by doing the, well, one, the compression does that. And two, you know, with the patcher preset, we're getting rid of some of that low end on the sides as well. Um, so the combination of those things help clean up the low end quite a bit. And uh, ultimately, the, the sonic balance of the track ended up being a lot, I guess you could say brighter, but just overall cleaner sounding. But when you have a short attack, what that means is that the compressor is kicking in immediately uh, or, you know, quicker than if you had a longer attack and then it would take longer to kick in. So you can let some of the transients kind of 
uh, punch through a little bit more when you have this longer attack. And so that's what I did with the mids and the highs. You know, I kind of, especially the mids, I wanted more of those transients to kind of punch through the mix a little bit. So that that's my my thought process behind sort of the attack settings. And then same with the release. If you guys are not really familiar with what compression is doing, I did do a video on compression, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago. I'll be sure to have something pop up on the screen if you guys want to check that out. But then in the master channel, basically what I have going on here is you can think of this as limiting. Technically what I have going on, if you hit F1, we can actually take a look at what's going on in Maximus and learn a little bit more about it. But this is a visual example of what's actually happening here. So in my case, I'm actually doing compression uh, and not limiting. This would be limiting, but I'll call it limiting just because technically the final stage is, you know, you, re you refer to it as limiting. The reason I ended up going with more of a compressed sound was it just sounded better to me with this particular mix. Uh, so, you know, you can experiment with both of these with limiting and compression and kind of see what works for you. But yeah, so for whatever reason in this particular master, I ended up turning up a lot more of the pre-gain and then not really doing a whole lot of post gain. I mean, I do have still like 4.7 dBs of post gain going on here on the master. And then the other thing that you wanna make sure that you do if you're using Maximus is you wanna set the threshold to about 1% or something like that. That's a little bit of saturation. And then you wanna bring your ceiling down to negative one dB. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna give you a little bit of headroom for whenever your song is uh, exported or compressed down to an MP3 file, because there can be inner sample peaks, which will actually go above the threshold that you set. So if you set your threshold to zero decibels, they'll go above zero decibels. And this is just one of those things that's recommended by mastering engineers and by streaming services like Spotify. So anyway, that's just a good practice to get in the habit of doing. Uh, doing a full dB of headroom is quite conservative. Some people do a little bit less than that. I've heard people say leave, uh, you know, set it to about negative 0.3 dBs or something like that or negative 0.5. Um, but yeah, I, I, I always set it to just a full decibel just to be on the safe side. Now, before we wrap things up, let's go into a little bit more detail about the compression here on the bands, uh, just so you can kind of be aware of what's actually going on. So if I'm looking at my monitor here, I can kind of solo this and listen to stuff and then make adjustments based on, you know, what it sounds like. And I can kind of bring this down to determine the level of compression. And then I can play with the tension as well here. So let's play with this a little bit, just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So hopefully that makes sense. You can experiment with that on your own. An alternative way to go about doing this where, you know, I turned up the pregame quite a bit. Instead of turning up the pregame, or maybe not turning it up as much as I did. Another probably more common way that you would use a compressor is to do makeup gain. So you're actually using the post gain instead of the pre gain. So what we do in this case is pretend this pre gain's down and then we're listening to something. We have a certain level of compression and we kind of get an idea of how many dBs of compression is going on. And then we use the post gain to kind of turn that back up in order to get it to, you know, kind of the original level it was at. Now, if I turn up the post gain based on what I, the settings that I have currently going on, uh, we'd start getting a lot of distortion because I've already got my master channel post gain turned up quite a bit, but hopefully that makes sense. And that's, you know, kind of an alternate way that you can do things. The last thing that I want to mention here is that in the bands, we do have a stereo separation knob. So as you can see in this, I did a little bit more stereo width uh, on the mid section and then also on the high end. I know the cool thing you could do here is you could actually turn the low end into more mono, but because we've already sort of gotten rid of the low end on the stereo sides anyway, with our uh, trick that we did earlier, 
don't really need to worry about that for this, but it is another really cool thing about Maximus. So that's really all I have for today's video. I hope you liked it. If you did, be sure to hit the like button. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and don't forget to hit the bell notification. That'll let you know in future uploads. Uh, right now I'm trying to do an upload every weekend, so you can keep an eye out for that. If you're struggling with anything production related or if you're new to production and you need some help, I do offer one-on-one -on -one private lessons, which you can sign up for on my website. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description of the video if you guys want to check that out. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.